crazy, crazy mornings. Our, uh, for one thing, our internet is out, is down for some reason, and it's, I don't have time to, to do the uh, troubleshooting to get it back up. So we're streaming uh, using my phone this morning, so if you're listening via live stream, uh, you'll notice probably a little bit of difference. We're not using our, our good equipment this morning. Uh, also, this is uh, our, our communion Sunday, and just remind you that, uh, that we will have the kind of the normal thing, we'll have our song service, and I'll preach for a little while, and then the communion is at the end, and if you're, if you're listening in, again, be on live stream, we will shut it off before the communion. That's kind of an intimate family time, so we won't be streaming that. All right, if you have a bulletin handy, just a reminder of a few things that are going on. Guys, the DVD this morning, if you weren't here, that, that series has been so good. Now, I get it. You know, it's, a, it's an hour long, and we're not used to that kind of uh, attention span uh, of just teaching. But I, I'm telling you, it is so, so good, especially this last one, because it's kind of an explanation of what in the world's going on in our country. Um, how we have got to this place where there's just so much insanity. And I think that what, you know, I, this is the second time through it, and I'm not remembering a lot of this stuff, but I think what's going to have to happen is we're going to have to do this in a more condensed way, you know, uh, where we just kind of go through it somehow and instead of spreading it out over almost two years, I think, is what it takes. So we're going to be looking at that, but if we show it again at a different time, I, I, and you haven't seen it, I, I don't know how I can strongly encourage you enough to, uh, to come and be and get, sit in on it. I, I'm not going to loan them out. I've had bad experiences on that. They somehow get lost or don't make their way back, so I'm not going to loan them out, but we probably will show it again in a different format. All right, but that's anyway, that's past. Uh, choir practice, remember, if you're a part of choir, we're next Saturday, we're going to be having it at 8.30 instead of 10 o'clock, and the reason for that, sound, the guys from Sound and Music are going to come down and help us with some issues that we're having with our sound system, so the only time they can get down here Saturday is 8.30, so we'll have an earlier choir practice. Uh, believe it or not, our Christmas program is next Sunday, and that will be 11 o'clock. Uh, I can't believe that it's here already, yeah. and I, I know I can't believe we're ready, so we're going to have to do a lot more cramming yet, at least speaking for myself. Uh, the 20th, we have a business meeting. Um, the budget is already done, and I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. Just remember that family day this month, the 27th. Um, if you'll look at the offering report, uh, just a couple of things we need to talk about. Um, we had a disastrous offering last week, and that's kind of been the way October, November is going. All, all the way through, uh, up through September, the offerings were great. In fact, <laughs> I, I'm an idiot. I'll just tell you that. I'm an idiot. You know, I was, I was crying wolf because of the budget. Uh, if you remember, we had where it says the weekly general fund, we had $2,300 there. And so I crunched numbers for October and November, and we were $570 a week short of, of meeting that budget. So I've been working on the budget to see what we're gonna have to do. I pulled out the budget for last year, and guess what? That figure was wrong. And the, the correct figure is $2,020. Now that's the good news. The bad news is we're still, we're still out meeting the budget. So uh, the new budget, what we're going to do is, uh, we've been talking about this, we're going to take the mortgage out. And we're, we start a project called Mor Murder the Mortgage. And if we take the mortgage out of the budget, then we fall right in there where we need, need to be. Um, in, the, in the new budget, if we meet the new budget. And that, you know, again, uh, the, you know, I don't want to be like everybody else blame COVID, but that, that's part of the problem. People are afraid to come, and when they don't come, they usually don't give, and so there's a fall in the, in the offerings, and, and I think that that's part of the problem. Uh, so 
I don't know. I, I'm not sure that this is going to uh, be the total solution, but I think if we can take the mortgage out and work on paying it off, that it's going to go a long way. And then we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, I, at this point, I'm not going to have to go to work or not going to move into the White House. That was the White House being right there, not the one in <laughs> uh, So that's kind of good news. Uh, but, but we're still going to have to wait and see. Uh, I Surely, though, I'd probably be better me moving in the White House than the one that's going to be moving in there. <laughs> anyway, that's another subject. All right. Um, so... The mortgage balance, this is what we're going to be working on. You, you, I remember if you've been coming, you know, we already had a one ten thousand dollars gift already, which is, praise the Lord, incredible. Um, that, that has brought down the mortgage balance to $17,530. And, and again, just if you can't do anything else, pray that God would provide that amount of money. I think a reasonable goal is that we would do that over the next year, all right? I'm not asking that we, it have, if it happens sooner, that'd be great, but uh, my goal is to see it paid off by the end of next year. That's a reasonable goal. And we'll, the payments, hopefully we can make out of the money that's coming in to retire uh, that. That's kind of the, the goal. So just pray about it. If you can't give, if you can't, you know, Big amounts would be awesome, but if not, I know Joan and I, we've talked about this, we're, we're probably going to do, after the first year, you know, add some to our regular systematic giving, um, unless the Lord provides a way to come up with a big gift. Uh, try, I tried to rob Star Bank, but they're not even open right now, so I, that's how it works. I'm kidding. Don't be calling me. <laughs> All right, well, let's go ahead and get started then this morning. I think I've shared with you all that I need to. Just keep in mind, uh, again, next week is the is the Christmas program, and then on the 20th, then we'll be voting on the on the church budget, which is already done. Some, if you want to look at that in advance, just let me know. I can give you a copy of it, but we'll be voting on, on the 20th. All right, we're going to sing hymn number 223 stand uh, you don't way too comfortable so stand and we'll sing 223 223 <laughs>
praise you. Mm. And Lord, we just thank you so much for loving us, Lord. You give all the love that you could possibly give by dying on the cross for us, Lord. Mm. We just thank you for that. And Lord, we just thank you for your glorious resurrection, Lord. And, and we also thank you, Lord, that you just gave everything to us that you could to get us to heaven. Lord. Right. You could give no more but your life, Lord. Right. We just thank you for that. And Lord, we know that one day you're going to come and take us home to be with you, Lord. I just pray for that day, Lord, and, and for that we can see you face to face and tell you how much we love you. And Lord, just be with everybody here today, Lord. If there's anybody here that doesn't know you as Lord, I just pray, Lord, that they'll come to know you today. In Christ's name, I ask you. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seen. Seek a place of safety. It's pending our time. <coughs> 224. 24 in your hymnals. <laughs> Church, aren't we, Victory? 
And uh, I don't, there's not a whole lot you can say about that, especially when you were one of the ones who were aged. Uh, somebody said about the only thing about an, having an aged church is that when one of them leaves the parking lot, there's two spaces available. So I'm not sure how to take that. Uh, in the parable of the rich fool, uh, the Lord answers the question. What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with enjoying some of the fruits of our labors, but the rich fool had missed the point of his life. And that point that he had missed is that he had not been rich towards God. So as we near in the end of another year, as we near the end of another year, we need to ask ourselves not whether our investments did well in 2020. They probably didn't, folks. The critical question is, have I been rich towards God? And how you measure that is by our generosity and we are generous people uh, we will be rich towards god we have given as god has laid upon our hearts to do uh, then god's going to bless and i trust this morning that as we to receive our offering that you might uh, be cognizant of the need here at victory and be a part of the solution uh, to the success of the ministry of our work here that we can reach people in this community. So men, if you come, please, we'll receive our offering. And may the Lord bless you this morning as you give. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. We pray, Father, this morning that you'll bless now. We're thankful, Lord, for each one that's uh, with us this morning, those listening in. We just pray, God, that you will help us as we endeavor to reach this community for Christ and also to reach the world through our missions outreach. We pray, Father, that you'll bless us in a very special and a wonderful way this morning. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.
to forego that last song until after a while we have communion or, or not. I don't know. We'll see. But for right now, open your Bible to John's Gospel, chapter 20. We're going to, we're going to read a long passage this morning, verses 11 through 31. While you're turning there, though, there's another announcement I forgot to give. Uh, beginning next Wednesday, we will stream the first half of the service. Uh, we've kind of changed things up on Wednesday night now. We finished our uh, DVD series that we're, we were doing. So I, the first half I'm teaching on prayer. And then uh, wonder of all wonders, who would think you would do this on a, on a prayer meeting night? But we're actually praying uh, on the second half. So we're not going to stream the second part, but the first part we will uh, as I'm teaching on the subject of prayer. But this morning we're in John's Gospel, chapter 20, and I want to read verses 11 through 31. John chapter 20, beginning then in verse 11. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, when the where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back, and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him thence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things unto her. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so I send, you, send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said, said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, the disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then he said, Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my son, side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Lord, we thank you for the grace that has brought us to this hour. Lord, as we uh, 
visited recently, Lord, if we can't thank you for anything else, we can thank you this morning that we are not in hell this very moment and for all eternity. We're grateful for your saving, sustaining grace. We're grateful, Lord, for the grace of opportunity. And so, Lord, we pray if there's someone here that has not yet accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, Lord, that they would do so today before it's everlasting too late. And Lord, for those of us who know you, increase our faith, Lord, which translates to increase our dedication and service to you. And we'll thank you for it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, you might have expected that, that the disciples had recovered from the devastating blow of finding out about the crucifixion of Jesus because they, after all, they had seen the evidence of his resurrection. The empty tomb should have caused great rejoicing and celebration, and that should have been going on and on, but instead we find the disciples withdrawn in some kind of state of shock. They were like many Christians today who when faced with a trial or hardship begin to fall apart spiritually. They begin to doubt and their faith wavers and they lose hope. They develop a defeatist attitude. And of course when a person has a defeatist attitude all they think and talk about is what is going wrong and their problems. And when a person gets to that state of mind, the facts are obscured and the light of God is hidden by the dark clouds of pessimism. But think about this. Jesus is alive. Yet his disciples are acting like he's still in the grave. The one thing that we must do as believers is keep in mind that no matter how bad things get, no matter how many 2020s we have, no matter how, things, how bad things get, God is still in control and he is still working in people's lives. Amen. In fact, as we, again, we've had to look at this often here lately. Everything that happens to a believer in life is by divine design and it's for our good. Romans 8.28 and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called, upon, uh, called according to his promise. Now, we may not always see that. In fact, it's, sometimes it's very difficult. But if we can see it, folks, it's not a response of faith. Amen? Faith is a positive response to what's going on in spite of the fact that we may not see it or understand it, in fact, may be overwhelmed by it. God knows what he is doing. Yeah, he, he never has to say, oops. He never has to say, oh, what am I going to do now? He is the sovereign Lord of the universe and the sovereign Lord of the circumstances that we face day by day. Amen. Now, we don't have to know or understand or see. We only have to trust him and rejoice always, even in the trying times. The disciples are not at all reacting to the events of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection as they should have been. Yet, we know they eventually get it right, but they're not there yet. And so this morning, I want to look at their reactions and what should have been their reactions. And we're going to consider three of those reactions. First, but first, I want to survey the passage. You say, well, that's going to take forever because that's a lot of scripture. It's going to be a mountaintop survey, okay? In this chapter, God, John gives us uh, four scenes. Now, the first one we've already looked at last week, Mary, or last message, rather. Mary had come to the tomb to take care of the body of Jesus, but she found it empty. From there, she went and told Peter and John about her discovery, and they came 
running to the tomb only to find it empty of its contents. From there, John simply notes that his disciples went away again to their own homes. That was the first scene. The second scene that John presents is that of the Lord's appearance to Mary, excuse me, Mary in verses um, 11 through 18. The third scene that John presents is that of the Lord presenting himself to his disciples minus Thomas. And then in verses 19 through 23, we have the last scene, which is the appearance of the Lord to all of his disciples with Thomas present. Now, in each of these last three scenes, what we're considering this morning, we have the appearance of the Lord, the reaction by the disciples, the statement by the Lord. And it is the reaction, their reaction to the Lord's appearances that I want to note in particular. As we study, we're going to see some striking similarities to the reactions of a lot of people today towards the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll see how important it is for our faith to be based purely on the word of God and not mixed with unbelief. So first of all, the first thing we have, or actually the second, but the first that we're going to consider this morning is the reaction of Mary. Now, the reaction of Mary, we can state it this way. Feeling is believing. I, I could preach on this a long, long time. I could preach on it because of the way a lot of believers live and the way it's what's going on in a lot of churches. But Mary's reaction was feeling is believing. We see this in verses 11 through 18. Now, I'm not going to read the text again, but Mary, sometime after the disciples had left, stood outside the tomb weeping. That, and that was natural, okay? In her grief and the turmoil of her heart, she stooped again to look inside the tomb. And I, I'm sure that she's not prepared for what she saw in the tomb because two angels were sitting at each end of the body where Jesus had been laid. And so she has this conversation with the angels, and then she turns around, and in the midst, of the mist rather, of her eyes, she sees someone else. Now she's not able to see who it is, but she supposes that it is the gardener. All right? In verse 15, she's supposing him to, the, to be the gardener, saith to him, Sir, if thou hast borne him thence, Tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Now again, Mary's heart's still filled with grief, but it's also filled with the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. She is not thinking about what she's saying, because she is telling this man, she supposed the gardener, tell me what you did with Jesus, and I'll get him and take him away. Well, here, Jesus is a, at this point in his life, a grown man. He would have been wrapped in about a hundred pounds of spices. Now, I don't, I, we really don't know how big Mary is, but I, I have a hunch that she couldn't have handled that task. But it didn't make any difference because she had felt so much love for the Lord Jesus, and she just wants to do something. Well, after the offer to take away Jesus and uh, we suppose give him a decent burial, Jesus speaks to Mary. And all, all he says is her name, Mary. Maybe, maybe it's the way he said it to her or maybe at that moment she got a glimpse of him. But in either case, she recognizes the Lord and addresses, addresses him as Rabboni, which is Aramaic for Lord or teacher. She reached out to take a hold of him. Jesus instructed her not to do that, but rather to go and tell the disciples that he had, had risen from the dead and was going to ascend to the Father. So convinced, now at this point, and encouraged, Mary went back to tell the disciples that she had seen the Lord. We see that in verse 18. So for Mary, 
feeling was believing. Now, Mary is like a lot of lost folks today, and unfortunately, a lot of saved folks who are waiting for some kind of feeling. You know, Lord, I'll, I'll get saved if you just let me feel your presence or let me feel uh, some kind of religious thing and, and I'll get saved. Now, I don't know if there's anybody in here like that, but I think there are a lot of people who are just waiting for some kind of feeling. Then there's a lot of Christians who, who have that same mental attitude. Lord, if, if you'll just reveal yourself to me in a, in a special way, or if you'll just come to me, what they're saying is I really don't feel like doing what I'm supposed to do, so I need something more. The truth of the matter is, though, we don't need any kind of feelings to serve the Lord. And if you do need feelings, you'll never serve him. And if you need some kind of feeling to be saved, you'll never get saved. Mary says feeling is believing. The gospel, though, is not something to feel. It's something to obey. 1 Peter 4, 17 says, For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? You don't need a, you don't need a feeling to get saved. You just need to respond to the truth of the gospel message and own up to your sinfulness, repent of it, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is who he is and what he's done for you. Don't wait for a feeling. You know, I, I wish I could help people out that have that, maybe carry a stun gun or something. I just need some kind of feeling. Okay. <laughs> I don't think that works. We don't need feelings, folks. Amen? We just need to obey the objective truth of the Word of God. All right, so don't wait for feelings before you obey God. The third reaction, the second that we're considering this morning, is the reaction of the disciples, and it would be reflected in this phrase, seeing is believing, verses 19 through 23. Now, from this scene, John quickly moves to another. This scene short shows kind of a defeatist attitude. The disciples are assembled together behind closed doors. They're fearful that the Jews will come and take them like they had taken the Lord Jesus Christ. They had seen or heard of an empty tomb. They had heard the teachings of the Lord regarding the resurrection, yet it seems as if they are gathered together in fear and not confidence or belief, which should have been characteristic of those who realized that their leader was killed, but that death did not have the final say in his life. Now, it's in the midst, though, and God is so gracious and so good. In the midst of these fearful disciples, Jesus appears. And what he does, they, they turn pale as a ghost. The Bible says in Luke 24, 37, but they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. What about what Jesus had told them? What about the empty tomb? All of that's gone, and now they think they're seeing some kind of spirit or ghost. But with the words, peace be with you, a calm settles over their hearts. And when they see who says these words, they gather around for a closer look. And so the disciples at this point are saying seeing is believing. If I can see it, if I can just see it, I can believe it. <clears throat> but we have been talking about this in our last lessons or sermons, you cannot walk by sight and faith at the same time. Those who walk by sight say seeing is believing, but those who walk by faith say believing is seeing. There's a big difference. The disciples, before this 
appearance were not seen because they did not believe, they did not believe what Jesus had said. Mark 16, 11. And when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. Mark 16, 12. And after he appeared in another form and to two of them as they walked and went in the country. In verse 14, afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and abraded them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. They did not believe, therefore they did not see. Again, they're not much different than those who taunted the Lord when he's on the cross. They says, record in Mark 15, 32, let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. I need to press upon you this morning, though, that we're, we're saved not by things that we can see. We're saved by faith. By grace are you saved through faith. Yeah. Not seen, through faith. Seeing is not believing. Believing is seeing. Mark 9, 23. Jesus saith unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. All right, then. The last scene that we're going to consider this morning is the reaction of Thomas. Thomas' reaction can be framed in this phrase, proving is believing. Proving is believing. Most of us are familiar with this passage. This is how Thomas got his nickname. Doubting Thomas, that's his nickname. But I don't think he's much different than the other disciples, maybe just a little bit more open about it. For, for Thomas, like many, it was a case of show me. He must have been from Missouri, right? That's the show me state. Show me. If you can prove it, I will believe it. For them, proving is believing. But here's the thing. The things of God are not received by proof, but by faith. That, that's not to say that there is no proof. We, this series with, that we've been going through uh, on the first Sunday of the month, that really faith building, but not faith establishing, because you have, to, you have to have faith first, amen? But there's plenty of evidence concerning the faith, but that's not how we're saved by, by it being proved to us. In fact, if your heart is not willing to, there is no amount of proof in the world that will convince you. The issue is not so much the proof, it's your will. Here's the truth about the gospel message. You may either accept it or reject it, but it's not a matter of proof. How can you prove, by the way, that God exists? Is there anybody in here can prove that God exists? I didn't think so. Does, we, can you show him to me? Now, we can see his handiwork, obviously, but we can't see God. How do we know that Jesus really lived? I'm not trying to undermine your faith, but how do we know that, in fact, how do you know any historical figure ever lived. The historians might be lying to us. Like the politicians today, right? That's all I'm going to say about that. The fact is, some things you just have to accept by faith. For example, you have to accept by faith that this is the word of God, the message of God for us in this day. That it is accurate and it is reliable and we can build our lives on what it says. Amen. And by the way, once you do that, once you believe, then the Bible opens up in amazing ways and strengthens our faith. That's why the Bible says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. 
We, we weren't there when they crucified Jesus, when they buried him, when he rose from the dead. But we have the word of God on it. And that's what we believe, what God has said. And I don't know about you, but personally, I am, I am just as sure about the facts of the gospel as if I were there. Maybe even more sure. That's faith. Faith is believing God's word and responding accordingly. We understand by faith, not proof. Hebrews 11.3 says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, we understand. By faith, we understand. And again, it's not groundless because faith, faith is an object. The object is what God has revealed to us in his word. And when we believe that, when we respond in faith, then God blesses us in the case of the gospel with salvation. Just taking him at his word. That's what it means. Taking him at his word. By faith we understand, not by proof. Well, there's another scene and that we're not talking about in these three scenes that are recorded. This scene is an unfolding scene. In fact, you're living this scene right now. And it is the the reaction of future followers, trusting is believing. I am going to read this this morning. Verse 29 through 31. Then saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Notice, note what John says, these are written, that what he wrote became the part of the word of God so that we could believe what he recorded and that we could be saved. This is the response of trusting is believing. Now what I, I want you to look at your own life this morning. Don't think about anybody else here this morning. But look in your, at your own life. Where are you in this scene, an unfolding scene that's taken place again and again and again since the time of Christ? Hopefully you're not of those other groups that we've talked about. Seeing is believing. Feeling is believing. Convincing is believing. But you are of the group trusting is believing. Blessed are those who do not need to feel or see or have proof, but nevertheless trust who believe without seeing. And that's the question I have you this morning. Do you believe? And I'm not asking you this morning, are you part of a Baptist church or have you been baptized or are you doing religious things? My deep Penetrating question, I hope this morning is, have you believed? Have you believed? Are you trusting the gospel message that is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for your salvation? Are you trusting it for the saving of your soul? And as a believer, are you trusting him in the trials of life? And guess what? Guess what? You're going to have them. You're going to have them. Do you get a defeatist attitude? I, I love the words of Habakkuk, chapter 3, verse 17 through 19. Although the fig tree shall not blossom. This is in a Nigerian culture. This is how they made their living. 
Though the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vine, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat, the flock shall be caught up, off, cut off rather from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hind feet, and he will make me to walk upon high places. No matter if all this bad stuff happens, I, I am going to rejoice in the Lord. Because listen, folks, this isn't heaven. We're not there yet. We're living in a fallen world, and guess what? Part of that fallen world is still in us in the form of a sin nature. And this life is not a picnic, it's a battle. <coughs> but one of these days, either through the upper taker or the undertaker, we're going out. And those of us who know the Lord will go to a place where there, where there's no fallenness, there's no sickness, there's no disease, there's no hatred, there's no envy, there's no pride, there's no sin whatsoever, not just for a couple of weeks, but for eternity, a perfect place Amen. with a perfect Savior. Right now, guess what? You can look to your neighbor and say, you're not perfect. And they can look at you and say, you're not perfect. Because we're not. Amen? But we are being perfected. And one day God will finish that work. That's our hope. Meanwhile, I, I don't want to say we have to be stoic. You have to grin and bear it. Meanwhile, we keep our focus on him and what he has for us in the future. God is in the process of remaking all that we lost in the fall. When Adam and Eve sinned, the world was cursed. And, and there they had a sin nature in redemption. In, just think about death. Here's, I love this formula. And if you're not saved, please think about this. If you're born one time, you're going to die twice. You're going to die a physical death, and you're going to die a, an eternal death in hell forever and ever and ever. However, if you are born twice, that is, you have your physical birth, but you're born again, you will 